Hi, new or potential new Darktable user. In episode 85, we started our look at the darkroom view of Darktable. And in this episode, we are going to finish it off. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 86 of Understanding Darktable. In the last episode, we started our investigation of the darkroom. Now we're just going to pick it up from where we left off. Moving across, we have Enable Focus Peaking Mode. That will show you which parts of the image are deemed to be in focus. And that's simply based on contrast information that Darktable has read from the image. Next up, you've got Toggle Color Assessment Conditions. That will simply give you a white border and a gray background. You can use the Tab key to remove your two side panels so that you can just get an idea of how the image looks without any other visual clutter on screen. Next up, we've got Toggle Raw Overexposed Indication. Right-click for options. So this will show any clipped pixels in the raw data. This does not refer to clipping that you may have introduced in your processing. This is simply the raw data. Again, if we right-click, you can choose how you want to view any clipping. You can choose what color you want the clipping to show up as, and you can choose the clipping threshold. Next up, we've got the clipping indicators for the processed image. Now, this also can be right-clicked, and you can choose what it will show you clipping for. The full gamut, any RGB channel, luminance only, or saturation only. So if I set that to luminance only and I then left click and drag on my histogram to increase my exposure, we will see that when I am clipping pixels, those pixels will be displayed in red on my image. And as you would have seen from those uh, options, you can choose what color scheme to display it in so that if you have a lot of red in the image, obviously having red as your overexposed indication might make it a little hard to see. Uh, you can choose the lower and upper thresholds as well. Next up, you've got the soft proofing. I will confess I've never really looked into soft proofing, so I'm hoping you know what it means. And then finally, we've got the overlay lines. So things like the crop and rotate module, which would be right here. If we choose to have guides turned on, this indicator here refers to the color of the lines for those guides and any other things that might require the drawing of lines on your image. So things like masks, etc. So you could say, I want those to be red or I want them to be green. Again, if you're working with a color image that has a lot of one particular color in it, then you might want these guides to be some other color so that they are more visible. I personally am happy with gray. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of actually processing an image because I'm assuming you already understand those basics. Things that you do want to be aware of is that each module has a power icon in the top left hand corner. You don't have to activate it because when you go into any module, if you click or activate any single thing, that will automatically turn on that module. You then have this multi instances action. If you left click on here, you will see that you can create a second instance or a third or a fourth or a fifth of any module. So you might, for various reasons, decide that one color zones module or one RGB curves module is not enough for you to do all the things that you want to do. You might want to use one module to process one part of an image but another instance of the same module to process a different part of the composition. So you can do that with the multiple instances button. As you can see, you can duplicate, move up, move down, delete, rename. Next, you have the reset parameters button for every single module. So you might have processed a whole bunch of different stuff on this image, but you then think to yourself, yeah, I don't like what I did on the Filmic RGB module, so you can simply hit the reset button and it will reset just that module. 
Then you have the hamburger, which will allow you to store and manage presets for that particular module. So you might, for example, let's go back to color calibration, wherever I put that, turn that on, and you might have you know, gone into here and gone, this is my monochrome preset that I really like. So you can click on store new preset, give it a name and you know, Bruce's black and white, you know, V1 and store that as a preset. Now, before I click on OK, you'll also notice there are some options here to auto apply this preset to matching images. This is a very powerful feature indeed. By clicking this box, we now get the opportunity to enter search criteria that Darktable will use not for existing images. It will only do it for images imported in the future. But let's suppose you want to enter A7 III to say this camera, whenever I import images that were shot on this camera, I want this preset from this module, color calibration, applied to all of those images. Now that's a rather extreme example. I'm not suggesting I would want every single image I ever imported to be processed with this monochrome preset, but you get the idea. And you can use any of these fields as criteria to create an automatic preset. You'll also notice there is this only show this preset for matching images. And again, you can choose certain criteria to say this preset should only be available for images which match those criteria. So you might do that with something like the lens correction module where you create a profile for a particular lens. Now, you shouldn't have to do that because Darktable uses the LensFun database and it does a pretty good job of automatic lens corrections anyway. But hypothetically, you could create a certain lens correction profile in the lens correction module, wherever it is. Lens correction. Yeah, it's right there. I'm blind. Sorry. <laughs> so you might create a certain preset here and then save that and say, whenever I shoot on this particular lens, automatically apply this preset or only show this preset for images that were shot with this particular lens. Okay, is there anything else I really need to cover in the darkroom? I don't think so. There is the search for a module text field here. So if you know the name of a module that you want, and like me, you just go and domestic blindness, I can't see what's right in front of me. And you can just type in lens and there's the lens correction module and you can then activate it or do whatever you need to do. Okay, last thing I'm going to cover is module order. Now, one thing that newbies to Darktable struggle with is the concept that the module order, in other words, the order in which modules are applied to your data, in other words, to the, the pixels in your image, is different to the order in which you applied those modules. Okay. As we can see here, the last thing in the history stack is the color calibration module because I changed the color image to a monochrome image. But if we look at our active modules stack on the right hand side here, this reflects the order in which modules are applied. So from the raw data, the very first thing that happened was the raw black and white point got set then the white balance was applied, then the highlight reconstruction was applied. In this instance, it wasn't necessary because I didn't clip any highlights. Then the image was demosaiced from the Bayer pattern on the sensor. Then the orientation was read from the EXIF metadata, and that's simply about whether or not the camera was in landscape orientation or portrait orientation. 
then the exposure has been added, then an input color profile has been applied, then the color calibration module does its thing. It then passes that on to the sharpen module, which then passes it on to the filmic RGB module, which then passes it along to the output color profile, which then displays the image on screen. So as you can see, even though color calibration is the last thing I did in the history stack, it's not the last module to touch the data because it actually happens right back here is the fourth last thing in the pixel pipe. I did cover all of this in an episode and I know that pixel pipe was in the name of the episode. So just do a search, you'll find it. Uh, I go into that in a lot more detail. Now, up until Darktable 3.0, you could not modify this order in which the modules were processed. And believe me, there was a lot of debate and gnashing of teeth and pulling of hair about whether or not the developers should give that power to the end user. Ultimately, it was decided that yes, that power would be handed over to the user with the you know, strict warning of, you know, venture down this path at your own peril, right? This module order has been developed by people who understand this to a far greater depth than I do. And even I will very rarely, almost never alter the module order because it works really well as it is. If you want to get into mucking around with that, you can go to the presets here and you will find that there are two options already set. But let's suppose, for example, you have a valid reason for wanting to change where the color calibration module sits in the pixel pipe. Control and shift, left click, and you can now drag this module to anywhere else in the order. You'll notice that there are some places you can't drag it. That's because that would absolutely break things. So if I decide I want it to come after Filmic RGB, I simply release it there. And now the actual order in which the data is passed from one module to the next has been changed. And you will see down here, it now says custom. And again, you could then store that as a preset to say, I always want color calibration to come after Filmic RGB. I don't know why you would want to do this. Like I said, if you understand what you're doing, have at it. If you don't, just don't go there. You're asking for trouble. If you ever have confused yourself about, oh, I think I've dragged modules around and I don't know where I'm at, simply come to the hamburger and click version 3.0 default, and that will put the modules back in their default order. Alrighty, that is going to do it. I hope this has not been too overwhelming. I hope I've given you enough information to get up and running. If I haven't, if you have questions, comments, or feedback, please sing out in the comments down below. I do my best to answer at least every initial question that comes in on YouTube. So I will do my best to answer it if I can. If I can't answer it, I will tell you that I can't answer it. Okay, I hope you stick around. I hope you enjoy using Darktable. Definitely check out my four-part series on using masks because that is a phenomenal tool within Darktable. Those were, from memory, episodes 13 to 16. And yes, while that is a long time ago and was probably Darktable 2.4 or maybe 2.6, the Masks themselves haven't changed, although the way in which they are displayed has changed. Uh, they are now this series of icons across here. Uniform mask, drawn mask, parametric mask, drawn and parametric mask, and raster masks. Now, at the time that I did those videos, this has just occurred to me, 
raster masks didn't exist. Raster masks basically gives you the opportunity to reuse a mask from another module. I covered that whenever raster masks got introduced, which I think was either new features for 3.0 or new features for 3.2. So check out those videos as well. There's so much ground to cover and I, I, I don't want to recover everything that I've already done. I already feel like I've done that in these two videos to a certain extent. But hopefully you're good to go. All right, I'm done. I will catch you in the next one.